couldn't hang on to the way you used to feel about me, feel about me. You know that we could just be friends if you forget about me, forget about me. With all this shit that we've been through, you can't just say I'm sorry, but I'm sorry. You shouldn't hang on to the way you used to feel about me. Steve McQueen's 2011 film Shame is a movie that takes a hard look at sexual addiction. If you haven't seen the film, and I will again mention that this video contains spoilers, the film details the life of a sex addict living in New York. His tumultuous sister unexpectedly moves in with him, causing him undue stress, and he heavily leans into his addiction to cope. As the film goes on, his addiction starts to consume him. Eventually, he realizes that his sister has been having suicidal thoughts, but by the time he figures it out, his sister is already in a pool of her own blood. Luckily, she recovers, but the film leaves the audience guessing as to whether Brandon will use this wake-up call to curb his self-destructive habits. Whenever I watch a film that's centered around a concept that's grounded in reality, such as addiction, mental illness, or cellular biology, I can't help but ask myself, is this accurate? That is the premise of this series, and it's why today I'm talking to Lee Lordo, a clinical social worker in Vancouver who over his 21 years of experience has helped a great number of men struggling with sexual addiction. He graciously met with me at Cardero Bottega, which he described as the best uh, independent cafe in Vancouver. Unfortunately, because it is one of the best cafes in Vancouver, it's also one of the busiest, so I apologize for the background noise. The symptoms of sexual addiction uh, like almost any problem, as a matter of fact, is that there are a number of uh, parts of your life that begin to really show problems and stressors. Yoga, going to the gym, running. If you stop doing those things and you stop seeing your friends and you stop seeing your doctor and you are much less productive at work, you've got a problem on your hands. <laughs> and that's, that's true, especially of sexual addiction. I believe that everyone's story is unique uh, in terms of the people that come to talk to me. It could be uh, flashing someone in a park, or it could be uh, someone who's married and is preoccupied with uh, men in washrooms. It could be all, uh, all kinds of uh, manifesting. Of, yeah, different ways of manifesting. There are many different kinds of uh, approaches, just as in psychology there are different models of approach. Uh, the one that I uh, favor and the one that I like to use is one in which uh, the person is not the problem, but the problem is the problem. Particularly in the case of sexual addiction, of trying to deal with shame very openly because if you can put it at arm's length and look at it and talk about it as, it, as, it, as something in itself, this problem, that you have, then uh, it's not going to be so internalized uh, once you have it externalized. For this segment of the video, I asked Lee to watch specific clips from Shame in order to determine which aspects of the film accurately depict sexual addiction and which do not. Are sex addicts more likely to seek out prostitutes? Or are the clients of prostitutes more likely to be sex addicts? Seeking out prostitutes is one form of sexual uh, compulsion. And so it's not by any means uh, universal or, or common. It's just one form of many, many different forms. As for the second question, whether prostitutes are more likely to experience sexual addicts, um, uh, I don't have an experience as a prostitute myself, so I, you'll have to 
speak to one of those <laughs> one of those uh, sex workers to find out more about that. Listen, one more thing. Your hard drive is filthy, right? We got your computer back. I mean, it is it is dirty. I'm talking like hose, sluts, anal, double anal, penetration, interracial, facial, man, cream pie. I don't even know what that is. You think it was your intern? On my hard drive? Yeah, somebody's fucking with your account, man. We're blowing our wad in cash, you know? It takes a really, really sick fuck to spend all day on that shit. Does sexual addiction affect one's ability to adequately function in society? Compartmentalization is uh, a skill that allows people uh, in, to function in some cases, like in, during war, when it comes down to workplace, to have one sort of set of behaviors and to be quite productive at work. And if the person is using the uh, computer at work, you think, well, how could they, well, how in their mind could they be doing this? Well, it's a kind of compartmentalization. They think that they're safe enough if they're, you know, in a certain setting or a certain place that, that they can do, have a different behavior than they would from other parts of their life. Wasn't married long, gave it a shot, didn't really work out. Oh. Wow. What? Do you just see like what? a verse to the whole idea? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't understand why people would want to get married, especially nowadays, I mean, it's... Yeah. I don't see the point. In relationships. It doesn't seem realistic. Do those suffering from sexual addiction have trouble maintaining quote unquote normal romantic relationships? Well, it's the, it's the extent in which the sexual compulsion overrides uh, their common sense about how they should behave in their partnership. And particularly when it comes to time, if a lot of their time, and for that, in some cases maybe money, uh, goes to the sexual compulsion, then, um, then that's going to be a big problem in their life and their, certainly their relationship. And actually he's connecting in that uh, restaurant scene very, you know, very personally, very intimately with the woman he's dating and they're having an honest conversation. His ideas don't exactly match his behavior, however, and meaning that he has ideas about not being committed to a relationship, but meanwhile he's pursuing a kind of commitment. Right. You're my brother. So what? I'm responsible for you. Yes. No, I'm not. Yes, you fucking are. No, I didn't give birth to you. I didn't bring you into this world. You're my brother. I'm your sister. We're family. We're meant to look after each other. Is sexual addiction a result of the inherent person or of their environment? Well, first of all, let me take up nature and nurture. The answer is both. <laughs> you know, it's not one or the other. So we all have to deal with our, with our backgrounds and where we came from. And we all have to deal with the basic impulses we have as sexual beings. We're not bad people. So we're not bad people, but we come from a bad place. That could pretty much be said of everyone. But in their particular case, it's, it's assumed that they came from a very bad place. Uh, but we're not bad people, regardless of the problem, but particularly in the area of uh, compulsions, whether it's compulsion to drink or sex. Uh, there's so much shame associated in it that builds up over time that it becomes difficult to to grab onto this idea that, no, I'm basically a good person. Basically, you know, I really am a good person. And basically, other people are good people. It's just that they uh, come from a bad place, if you will. There's some suffering going on in their life. There is some pain, and they either half or entirely uh, know how to deal with it. Excuse me, or don't know how to deal with it. Just telling your pretty girlfriend here, I like to fuck her in that tight pussy of hers. <laughs> but I mean, bone her real hard. <laughs> so she's clawing up my back. Just kidding. This funny. After I fuck her hard up the ass, I put my balls in her mouth while I come in her face. Don't let me fuck you in the ass. You get the fucker in the ass. Tell me more, man, because you, 
I'm fucking loving this. It's not. Yo. The what? increase of stress in Brandon's life causes his addiction to spiral out of control. Is this realistic? Well, the more stress in life, the more a uh, problem can feed off stress and get bigger and bigger. And that's true of sexual compulsions as well as uh, any other kinds of compulsions or uh, depression or anxiety. So the more stressors, the, more, uh, the easier it is for a problem to just feed itself and get bigger and bigger. So again, Brandon is going down his rabbit hole of he's, he's been stressed out and he seems to be sort of going for any sort of sexual encounter he can. Uh, and when he can get into a particular club that he wants to go, he goes, a he goes across the street to a, like a male sex club. Well, gay club. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's not exactly, I mean, it appears to be just an ordinary that, gay club. A gay club? It's not a, <laughs> I mean, well, it's a little bit, uh, not every gay club is like that, uh, by any means. But, uh, but some are, so, and particularly in, in New York, you know, in a big city. Everybody in the men's room is like, nobody has to pee, I mean. <laughs> Are sex addicts more likely to seek out sexual encounters with either sex regardless of professed orientation? Well, let me just back up and say uh, there's a man named Kinsey who did a Kinsey report a long time ago and he had a scale of zero to six, zero being where someone is totally heterosexual, 100%, and six being where they're totally homosexual. And then you have bisexuality of all the gray in between. So it depends on the individual. And then again, it depends on the context. It's, we know from, uh, I haven't been in prison, but from prison films and from prison, from hearsay, it appears that uh, straight guys, uh, heterosexual men, when they have no other options, can sometimes turn to uh, uh, homosexual choices. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, otherwise known as the DSM, is used by mental health professionals to recognize and diagnose mental illness. Sexual addiction, however, was not included in its latest edition due to a lack of peer-reviewed evidence to establish the diagnostic criteria needed to identify excessive sexual behavior as a mental disorder. About a month ago, I asked you, the audience, whether sexual addiction should be a recognized disorder. And to my surprise, 70% of you said yes. When I asked Lee what he thought about it, his answer revolved around whether labeling an illness is helpful for the patient. Well, whenever someone asks me in general about, uh, or implicitly asks me, uh, whether a diagnostic term from the DSM-4, whether, uh, whether, whether, if they use the term, I'm very interested. First thing I ask myself is, and I ask them is, is this how is this how is this term useful for you, or do you find it useful? If they find it useful, we run with it. If they find it shameful or not useful, then I'm not. I don't introduce it uh, because why do I would why, why would I want to increase shame uh, for someone? Uh, so I'm not. Uh, I'm careful about the labeling potential, particularly a negative label, labeling of diagnostic terms in general. Um, so last question, uh, did you like the movie? Uh, I thought the movie was, I expected something that was a little bit more, expo uh, more of an exploitative uh, film, and I found that the, fil the filmmaker really went to, to pains to show to not exploit the, uh, the main character as a sex object for the audience. In other words, to encourage a, what film critics would call a sexual gaze on the part of the audience. It's a real cautionary tale, and I liked it as that, and that's what I think it was trying to do. The ending is not totally black and uh, dystopic. <laughs> with a, with a, it would leave you feeling like you wish you'd, uh, you know, chosen another film because it was so depressing. <laughs> when I first started this project, I had my doubts as to whether sexual addiction was even real. But according to an expert, shame is accurate in its depiction of sexual addiction. If you think you're suffering from a sexual addiction, Lee recommends that you assess with yourself and with someone you trust to determine whether the addiction is negatively affecting your life. Should you decide to seek professional help, you can seek treatment from a psychiatrist, which is free here in Canada, but Lee cautioned that the waitlist can be very long. 
Alternatively, you can visit a mental health clinic or speak to a psychologist or clinical social worker. And if you're interested in working with Lee himself, you can go to leetherapy.com for more information. This is a new series for this channel, so if you like it or you don't like it, please let me know about it in the comments below. Next episode, we'll be talking to an expert about M. Night Shyamalan's last film, Split, and how it depicts dissociative identity disorder. Thanks for watching, and until next time, this has been the Film Herald. Thank <laughs> you.